So today I'm going to continue my exploration of the Eightfold Noble Path. Um, it's the, an eight-part path that the Buddha taught um, that you can practice and it will lead you to the goal of liberation or enlightenment. Um, and so today I'll continue with right intention. Um, and so it's interesting to look at uh, the placing of right intention as number two um, because it sits between right view and then three actions that follow of right speech, right action, and right um, livelihood. And these comprise the higher training of ethical conduct. Um, and so Bhikkhu Bodhi, in his commentary to um, the Eightfold Noble Path, um, explains that by engaging in right view, we gain confidence in karma and the law of karma and its effects, in rebirth, in the possibility of enlightenment, and so on. And through this, there becomes a restructuring of um, our values that sets the mind um, in a certain direction um, that's looking towards attaining a different vision of what we can become, of what's possible, of the meaning of life. And so through gaining confidence in karma, in rebirth, in the possibility of enlightenment, we see the value in refraining from actions that harm ourselves or others, and we want to engage in actions that bring benefit to ourselves and others. And these will then create the causes for a string of good rebirths um, that will enable us to keep practicing the path so that we can then progressively attain the goal of enlightenment and full awakening. Um, but in order to do that, then we need a certain strength of mind um, to be able to um, sustain us through working with minds that are under the control of afflictions and karma and the various difficult situations that can come up that can derail us from living in a way that we wish to. And so the Buddha identified uh, three intentions, three attitudes that we can live each day, each moment of our life that will help us attain the goals that we wish. And these are um, benevolence or goodwill, renunciation and compassion. And so intention here is the crucial link between our worldview and then how we act and engage in the world. Um, Bhikkhu Bodhi says that thought is the forerunner of action, directing our body and, body and speech, stirring our body and speech into activity, and then using them as instruments to express its aims and goals. I find it quite beautiful. And so this relates back to what we hear very often is that Everything's, everything comes back to our motivation. And so right intention here gives us the reason for why we're practicing the Dharma. And when Venerable Chudnam was discussing this, she said, we're not studying Dharma and practicing it to make money. We're not doing it to please somebody. We're not doing it for fame and reputation. We're not doing it because we're bored. We're not doing it to compete with someone else. Rather, when we um, really look deep inside about what will benefit ourselves and others, we do it out of an attitude or an intention of benevolence, of goodwill, of compassion, and of renunciation. And in terms of people who are practicing within the Mahayana vehicle, that right intention extends to bodhicitta, the wish to become a fully awakened Buddha so that we can be a best, best able to help others um, achieve a state of lasting peace themselves. And so I went back to the original sutta where um, the Buddha identified these three as uh, the right intention to live by, and it's called the sutta of two sorts of thinking. And um, when he was, the Buddha was explaining this um, to his followers, he said, uh, monks, before my self-awakening, when I was just an unawakened bodhisattva, the thought occurred to me, why don't I keep dividing my thoughts into two sorts? So I made the thinking imbued with sensual desire, imbued with malice, imbued with cruelty, one sort. And on the other side, thinking imbued with renunciation, imbued with benevolence, imbued with compassion was another sort. And as I remained thus hateful, ardent, and resolute, thinking imbued with desire rose in me. And I discerned that thinking with desire has arisen in me, and it leads to my own afflictions at least to others' afflictions, and at least to afflictions in us both. It obstructs wisdom, it promotes displeasure, and it does not lead to unbinding or nirvana. 
So whenever, whenever, whenever thinking imbued with desire arisen, I simply abandoned it. I destroyed it. I dispelled it. I wiped it out of existence. And you continue with um, malice and uh, cruelty as well. Whenever thinking imbued with malice arisen in me, I simply abandoned it. I destroyed it. I dispelled it and I wiped it out of existence. So here, um, Buddha clearly delineates what is wrong intention and what is the right intention. And we say that there are two opposing factors. So uh, renunciation here is not the wish for liberation, but rather it's just a balanced mind that isn't attached to sensual objects and it counteracts sensual desire. And benevolence encompasses fortitude, forgiveness, and love. It makes your mind very open to engage with others um, and create good relationships. And this, um, this counteracts malice or ill will. And then compassion is an attitude of nonviolence and it counteracts cruelty. So at the highest level, um, bright view, um, the first of the Four Noble Truths, the four, Eightfold Noble Path, sorry, um, is the realization of the Four Noble Truths. Um, so then right intention must in some way spring from that, right? Um, with as it being the second step from this. And then Bhikkhu Bodhi shows how each of these three intentions relate to the Four Truths in a very beautiful way. So the understanding of the Four Truths in relation to one's own life gives rise to the intention of renunciation. And understanding them in their relationship to other beings gives, ri gives rise to benevolence and compassion. Because when we see how our own lives are pervaded by dissatisfaction or dukkha, and how this arises from craving, then the mind inclines to renunciation, um, to abandon the craving and the objects that we cling to as a source of pleasure. And then when we see um, the suffering in other living beings, um, that just like us, they want happiness, and just like us, they wish to be free from suffering, but they have so much suffering, and it's so hard to get this happiness that lasts. Then we have an intention of loving kindness and benevolence towards them, and of compassion, wishing them to be free from that suffering. And then in terms of the origin of our dissatisfaction, or the origin of our dukkha, um, the Eiffel Noble um, the factors of right intention and right view um, together counteract um, the three poisons of ignorance, anger, and attachment. Um, and Bhikkhu Bodhi says, the moment that we start engaging in the Eightfold Noble Path, the moment that we start cultivating any form of right view or right intention, we are destroying these three um, sources of pain and dissatisfaction within us. How? Because right view counteracts ignorance and right intention counteracts um, attachment and anger. This gave me a lot of cor courage and um, encouragement, thinking that just by slowly starting on this path in whatever way um, possible, I am mm, directly counteracting the forces that bring about my own unhappiness and pain. Um, yeah. And so we can see here in, in this presentation of wrong intention, right intention, um, the elements of mind training and thought transformation, where there is a recognition that uh, everything that we are is a result from our thought, of what we have thought. Um, and so this comes about in terms of when we have these afflictions within us that bring about these thoughts that aren't so helpful, um, that we can, through a process of thought substitution, um, dispel unhelpful thoughts of um, cruelty, of ill will, of sensual desire, wish, with beneficial thoughts of benevolence and compassion, loving kindness, and renunciation. So how do we actually do this um, in terms of practical day-to-day -day ways? So with renunciation, um, the turning away from the pursuit of sensual pleasures, of looking outside of ourselves for sources of happiness, we're going against a, a deeply ingrained habit um, that we've carried with it, within us from beginning this lifetimes. Um, and even, and this is quite huge, that even if we can see that clinging to objects outside of ourselves for happiness brings us suffering in some way, it's still so hard to work with that mind. And Bhikkhu Bodhi sums this up beautifully um, in his own way. 
He said, it is just at this point when one tries to let go of attachment that we encounter a powerful inner resistance. The mind does not want to relinquish its hold onto the objects that it has become attached to. For such a long time, it has been accustomed to gaining, grasping, and holding that it seems impossible to break these habits by an act of will. One might agree to the need for renunciation, might want to leave attachment behind, but when the call for it is actually sounded, the mind recoils and, re and continues to move into the grip of its desires. So this could seem hopeless. <laughs> But luckily, um, the Buddha explained very clearly how we can move beyond that. And it's through understanding, just understanding the situation that we're in very clearly. So real enunciation, the real mind turning away from sense pleasures, isn't kind of compelling ourselves to give up things that we don't want. It's actually looking at the objects, looking within ourselves and seeing very clearly um, how things exist such that desire just falls away by itself without any need to struggle. And he directs us to do this by um, looking to see whether desire and, desire and dissatisfaction are inseparable with the, with the idea that they are. And at first we might say no. But to consider in our own experience that when the moment that desire arises, we have the pain of want, the feeling of lack. Because if we're wanting something outside to fill a hole, then there is something missing. And then when we're struggling to fulfill that desire that is not so pleasant either, this yearning for something that's not within our grasp. And when our efforts fail to get what we want, how do we feel? We can feel discouraged, angry, frustrated, disappointed. And then when we get what we want, then we have to protect it. We have to find ways to get more and better. We have to find ways to try and control the source of that happiness. And then the demands of desire is that, it, that what it wants is eternal. That pleasure has to last forever. But then when we're faced with that, everything comes to an end. There's separation from this person, wealth, power, position. So renunciation is the freedom from all this. It's not uh, having to give up what we don't want. It's, it's freedom from this discomfort of always yearning and searching outside of ourselves for what we can find right within. And so, by familiarizing ourselves with, with the disadvantages of sensual desire and attachment, and familiarizing ourselves with the advantages of non-attachment or renunciation, then sensual desire can just fall away by itself, and we can attain the peace of mind that comes from that. And Bhikkhu Bodhi says, through repeated contemplation, one thought knocks away another. The intention of renunciation dislodges the intention of desire. And so with, com with benevolence and compassion, um, how do we do that? I think the teachings that we received this weekend on the analogy of the six buckets and the way to extend loving kindness and compassion to both ourselves and other living beings was beautiful instruction. So direct encourage everyone to continue meditating on that. And for those online, those teachings will be up very shortly. Um, yeah, I just found, uh, I'll close with a quote from Bhikkhu Bodhi in terms of giving us hope for how we can transform our minds from uh, a state of dissatisfaction, of ill will and cruelty. Um, that's obviously not within us every moment, but they, they rise up. We had that all inside of us. And to a mind of uh, renunciation, of compassion and loving kindness. And if we can take those attitudes with us in every moment of our day, then um, our own and others' happiness can be secured. And so with, whole, with wholesome, unwholesome thoughts is like a rotten peg lodged in the mind. The wholesome thought is like a new peg suitable to replace it. The actual contemplation functions as the hammer used to drive out the old peg with the new one. So we have to sit down and meditate. And the work of driving in the new peg is practice, practicing again and again as often as necessary until we reach success. <laughs>